welcome back everyone. So today we're going to talk about the next mechanism in evolution, natural selection. Natural selection is probably one of the most important mechanisms of evolution. Certainly the other ones uh, are important as well, but natural selection is one in which uh, I think the most um, detail uh, will be will, will go into. So let's just talk about natural selection. The definition of natural selection is it's a process in which individuals that have certain heritable traits, which we now know are called phenotypes, what you look like, what an organism look like, looks like, organisms with those certain heritable traits will have a higher relative fitness because of those traits. And you might say, well, what is relative fitness? Well, let's break it down. Relative doesn't mean uh, it doesn't mean your your aunt or your uncle or your cousin. Um, it's when you relate something one thing to another, you compare it. And fitness, we said, is it when an organism is able to uh, survive and reproduce, and an organism that has an increased fitness uh, is able to survive and reproduce at a higher rate than an organism that has a lower fitness. So relative fitness is just that, the contribution that one genotype will make to the next generation when compared to another genotype. And so if we, we put this all together, natural selection is a process in which individuals that have certain uh, heritable traits, which are phenotypes, and we know that those phenotypes are based upon your genotype, they're going to have a higher relative fitness because of those traits. That's natural selection in a nutshell. So let's make a few observations here. The first observation is that we can see members of any population, we're just gonna look at ladybugs here, or ladybird beetles is what they're called. Um, members of a population will often vary in their inherited traits. So if you take a look at these ladybugs, um, you see some of them are dark orange and some of them become almost yellow to, you know, um, like basically lighter orange. And some of them have many spots, some of them have much fewer spots, some of them have almost no spots. And so <coughs> these traits are things that they can uh, pass on uh, to the next generation, to their offspring. Uh, and so we just, we'll just leave it at that. Some of them, um, some of them have different traits and they're all members of the same population. The second observation is that all species can theoretically produce more offspring than their environment can support. Many of these offspring will fail to survive and reproduce themselves. So the example here is this puffball fungus, and this puffball fungus is a single organism, and it can produce in that spore cloud billions of spores. Each of those spores could theoretically produce a fully mature uh, puffball fungus. Now, when you go walking in the woods, you don't see billions of puffball fungi uh, laying around. And the reason for that is the environment cannot support every single one of those offspring, potential spores uh, to become offspring. And so they will not survive uh, and certainly not go on to reproduce, okay? So what determines which of these offspring will actually survive and reproduce? So there's variation in the population and then there's an overproduction of an offspring. What, what determines if they survive or not? So we'll get back to that, but let's talk about uh, these interesting little uh, organisms. Um, these are rock pocket mice, okay? And this is my artist's rendition of the rock pocket mice. You'll find them uh, in the deserts in, uh, you know, the southwest of the United States. Um, and let's say that we have an isolated population. By an isolated population, I mean no individuals are leaving and no individuals are coming in. So we've got an isolated population of all tan mice, okay? Tan uh, fur with white underbellies, but we're just really um, worried about the tan fur. Um, so in this isolated population, what is the only way in which a new phenotype, the way in which those mice look, can arise? So we, if you think back about it, it's isolated, so you can't have immigration. So how can we get uh, a different phenotype? 
Well, we remember that the genotype is what controls phenotype. The genotypes are your A's, T's, G's, and C's. So the only way in which we can get a new phenotype is through mutation, okay? Random mutation. Sometimes those mutations will be very detrimental. Sometimes they will cause no change. And sometimes they can cause changes um, that aren't going to kill the organism, but they will make them look different. And so let's say in this, organ in this population, the mutation arises in the fur color gene, and we now have some black individual mice being born. Now, these mice aren't uh, tan mice that turn black. They are uh, offspring of two brown mice who then had an offspring that turned black because of mutations in its genes. So what kinds of organisms eat mice? Well, uh, we know snakes do, certainly other birds, um, and birds of prey like hawks and owls. So let's use our owl here. Now this owl is hunting and we um, are on this sandy backdrop. So, so uh, it, what, what mice are likely to be the prime pickings for this owl? And certainly you probably understand that the black mice are going to stick out like a sore thumb on this tan background, right? There's a reason why these tan mice uh, are able to survive. Now, notice this mouse here uh, is, was tan, and this one over here is tan, and it does get eaten too because, of course, these, these organisms have been eating rock pocket mice for many years. Um, they've, you know, they've evolved to eat these, these mice. Um, but notice that almost all, if not all, of the black mice are gone because that trait is not going to be very beneficial on this tan background. So what do we call a trait that increases the fitness of an individual in a specific environment? The trait in this example is the brown fur. What would we call that trait? Because it increases their ability to survive and reproduce the fitness. Well, we call that trait an adaptation. It kind of makes sense, right? It's a trait that makes you more well adapted to your environment. So that's an adaptation. But let's say in this example that, that the black mice um, do die and then the brown mice survive and reproduce. But let's say we get a volcanic eruption and this volcanic eruption hardens on the, the sandy surface and now the sandy surface has been replaced by a molten black rock surface. Now, which of the organisms are likely to uh, be uh, have a trait that is considered an adaptation? And of course, you could now think, well, it must be the black mice. They are now well adapted to their environment. And so not, not saying that some of the black uh, mice won't still get eaten, but the vast majority that get eaten on this um, lava flow are the tan mice. And after you get survive, survival and um, you know, new babies are produced, new offspring are produced, you start to get a change to where we get a shift in the frequency of alleles in this population. And that is less tan mice and many more black mice until really all of the mice living on this black background will be black. So what do we call the environmental conditions that favor a particular phenotype and allow organisms to become adapted to their environment? Well, we call that the selective pressure. It's the environmental conditions that favor a particular phenotype. It is the selective pressure. It's what's selecting for what traits are adaptations or not. So let's look at uh, some different uh, selective pressures that made uh, organisms um, to, to have these different adaptations. So here are two different types of mantids. Um, if you can't tell, here's the leaf mantid in Borneo, and here is the body, the head, the eyes, two antenna, here are the legs sticking out. And what does he look like, he or she look like? Well, they look like, of course, the dead leaf litter on the ground. Now, how did this happen? Obviously, uh, not very quickly, uh, and, and certainly um, not because the organism thought I should look like a, a dead leaf. Um, but over billions of years of evolution, these organisms started to look random by random chance 
more and more like these dead leaves. Now, that's really just incredible at how unbelievably amazing these ant organisms look. And the reason for that is, well, let's just say way, way, way back in the timeline, these uh, organisms shared a common ancestor that per perhaps was green. Okay, green is going to stick out really like a sore thumb on this brown background. And so randomly, the mutation occurred that instead of green, some of them became brown, just like in our, in our rock pocket mouse example. And so you can see that if we continued this trend over billions of years, an unfathomable amount of time, that we could get eventually to an organism that looks something like this. Same example in the flower mantid. And notice that they are well adapted to, here is the flower mantid's leg, its other leg, here are its eye, its two front legs, and its antenna sticking off here, and it's hanging out on this flower, and it looks exactly like that flower. Now, why is it good? Because it can obviously avoid predation, and it can uh, hunt a lot easier too, because if a bug lands on this flower to pollinate, well, that's going to be lunch, and it will be none the wiser. And so these are just examples of the selective pressure, the backgrounds in which they are sitting on, the environmental conditions that make their phenotypes uh, be so uh, adapted to their environment. Another example here are the finches. These are often called Darwin's finches because when he uh, made his trip to the Galapagos Islands, he started to see that there were many types of these small birds, but they had many different types of beaks and as such, they fed on different uh, kinds of food. Uh, we had the cactus eater with a long, sharp beak, the seed eater, which has a large, big, thick beak, and then the little um, insect eater, which has a narrow, pointed beak. And Darwin started to think about this idea that organisms had very specific phenotypes that allowed them to do very specific things and it gave them very specific roles to play in which other organisms could not do. And he started to think about this when he came up with this idea of natural selection. Now here's another example of um, how organisms can change over time. This is the scale-eating fish. And um, so basically what they are, there are two uh, basically phenotypes in this population of scale eating fish. The left mouth, who they have a, a going left, and their right mouth, which go right. Now, they just pick off scales from these fish. It probably does not feel great, and obviously uh, eventually will uh, cause them problems. But you can see here in this graph the frequency of left mouth uh, or right mouth individuals. And so instead of being 50-50, they're always kind of changing which is more prevalent. And that's because if there are more left mouth individuals, the fish begin to guard that side so that the left mouth individuals then begin to get less food. And suddenly having the right mouth individual, having that right mouth is actually an adaptation at that point. So the right mouth individuals begin to increase, which would in this graph decrease the left mouth individuals. And then this, once they, the, the organisms that are getting preyed upon uh, get, get wise to that, they start guarding the right side, right? And then all of a sudden we see another shift. And so it's just changes in the environment that will change the overall adaptation based on their phenotype. So pretty interesting there. So with that, I'm going to leave you um, on natural selection. I'll post another video, uh, not done by me, but I think it's really good. It's called Natural Selection Stated Clearly. Watch that one. Let me know if you've got any questions, and I'll see you in the next lecture.